playable characters. After her stint in black exploitation films, she took to the mainstream in Greased Lightning, Ford Apache the Bronx, and her critically acclaimed turn in Quentin Tarantino's Jackie Brown. But behind the spotlight was a woman who had endured abandonment, multiple sexual assaults, and stage four cancer with a life expectancy of just 18 months. But today, in great health, she uses her success and fame to help others through multiple charities and activism, including being the national spokesperson for Dining Out for Life, an AIDS support fundraising campaign. Hello, I'm Ernie Manous. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with Golden Globe and Emmy-nominated actress Pam Greer. When you hear the term black exploitation, what does it mean to you personally? It came from a term other people came up with, but basically it was filmmaking of our community and our culture and our pop culture uh, for us to have our heroes and heroines and our music and and uh, the elements that are the good, bad, and the ugly in our community. And I was a college student and Roger Corman uh, had offered me a job in acting and I said no I'm, I'm, I'm a struggling college student with three jobs and I don't know anything about acting he said but you would be so perfect you're authentic here there's no makeup and hair and crazy you this you would play this perfect woman uh, in the Philippines in a prison and <laughs> I just said you know my mom and Gloria Stein and the women's movement said I need to get a degree I need to be independent and this horrible event happened and I said Roger I'll take that job I just want to get out go away from all of this madness of men trying to oppress you and marry you and if you're not married you're not validated in society and I just said I'll take the job but I can't be fired Roger seriously so he had to talk to my mama Gwen, <laughs> and he had to promise her that he would not fire me so he said here I want you to read this book get this book the actor prepares by Konstantin Stanislavski that was my Bible and when I read that book for me it wasn't black exploitation for me it was pure the method neighborhood playhouse actor studio mm -hmm. um, Lee Strasberg it was Chekhov Cherry Orchard Stanislavski how to respect the actor to be the actor and what the actor does and that's when I was mesmerized by what I was reading. I think uh, a wonderful compliment to what you do is that I think those early films people forget you were an actress. Because, yes. But it was in a role. that B right. movie genre. And so what Roger Ebert and uh, a lot of the film reviewers were saying that I elevated the work well, it was for tuition. Yeah. I, I couldn't be fired. <laughs> I said, I'm going to turn this whatever B movie, bra, red t shirt, wet t shirt. I'm turning it into, you know, uh, Stanislavski. Isn't her hair beautiful, Teresa? Isn't her hair beautiful, Teresa? Teresa? Yes, matron. Yes, it is. She'll be a relief after your hysterics. And it was camp. It was tongue-in-cheek. It wasn't to be taken seriously. But I would learn my lines. And many of the other actors, actresses, would say, oh, you can learn them in the morning. You know, we're used to this. You don't need to. We're going to go out. You want? No, I need to learn the lines, read the book. I, I did approach um, those movies and black exploitation, And people didn't see black exploitation. They saw their faces. Yeah. And it uplifted them. And it was a negative. Some people confuse black exploitation with black magic. You know, black hat, black negative, black cat negative. It had nothing to do with it. It had it was a culture. Mm -hmm. The culture was if they want to say exploitation, yes, blacks did not produce it, but it didn't bring a negative connotation to the storyline. Did this man send you to kill me? No, 
He didn't know nothing. Take her out and kill her. Now think of all the fun I could have had with a good-looking stud like you. You really mean that? This is the end of your rotten life, you don't push her. I've heard you say the only color they see in Hollywood is green. It's green. Trust me. Yeah. And so I, I, coffee, when, when I graduated from uh, the Roger Corman films, and I was going to stop. I would do three films, put the money in the bank, and then see, you know, oh, do I have enough to live and go to school? Can I, I can get in UCLA film school, but I need the money. To, no, no grants or scholarships were available. So I said, okay. I was the reluctant actor. I didn't get in, a, in the theater film industry to be an actor, possibly a cinematographer or a camera person. Yeah. I didn't feel I was uh, outwardly attractive pretty, whatever, they called me exotic, um, everyone wasn't, they were all American. I said, wait a minute, I'm all American, there's a whole bunch of American in me from all over, and I went through the transition of being, they say you're an actor, but I don't feel like the actor yet. Mm -hmm. I did it for tuition, and I don't, and I, as I was learning from Stanislavski and meeting the theater community, it m gave me a trajectory of wanting to do no, not the black exploitation, not the Roger Corman films. I did coffee. I didn't want to repeat it. Foxy Brown was a little more aggressive and progressive. Um, and then Sheba Baby was completely different. And then Bridie Foster was a cartoon character. And then every, because of my success for the film industry, making millions of dollars for people, um, I said, am I the actor or am I that celebrity? And I started to think, and so they would say, Pam, there's great stories. I know of great stories to take to, to the studios. And I took the Mary Fields, the first black female stagecoach uh, driver for the Mail Route in Montana. Gary Cooper had written about her. And it was on the cover of, of Ebony Magazine in, in 63 of this woman. And I remember the folklore of my family talking about this, this woman who was a stagecoach driver with a six team of horses. And I come from that Black West environment. And I'm going, what a great story. Found the story, took it to a big studio with my agents and stars and people, and they said, the audience will not believe that there was a black female stagecoach driver. And I said, okay, so I'm trying to bring legitimacy. I'm trying to do like good work, good theory, and it's just impossible. No, we really want you to, you know, shoot and kill and jump and drive cars through things. I said, well, you know, that's kind of boring. It's redundant. I don't want to do it. Did you ever consciously step away from Nike? Or was it I did. the work wasn't there and you weren't going to do the work? The work, work was there. Anything. I turned down a lot of work. It was so redundant. I even returned down television series as I do today that are quite derivative and they don't bring what I need and what I'm looking for. I had done Fort Apache, the Bronx, and I had to really mm -hmm. use my Stanislavski, my method to get that role, which was to, and no one could get that role. No one could play that role. Paul Newman was looking. Uh, uh, Suskind, David Scusson, the producer, um, uh, Daniel Petrie, the director, they went through everyone right. and they couldn't find a woman to play a psychotic serial g killer, nar uh, drugged out hooker. I'm saying, that's, you can't, that's not overnight research. <laughs> <laughs> That'll give me nightmares. And so I was the last person and an agent said, hey Pam, you know, there's no one can find uh, someone to fit this role. And he described it to me, he said, I fit a drug addicted serial killer hooker. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> he says, no, you have a quiet, you have, you might be able to do it because it takes profound study. You can't just study, go in and play as this character. You have right. to live and be this character. And it was frightening. So I said, I don't, if I can get you the audition, will you go? I said, I don't know. I might stutter. <laughs> That's the first <laughs> thing I think of. I'm gonna be afraid, and it's gonna show that I'm not that ho that shooting, rooting, tooting, you know, yeah. big head, you know, like I studied martial arts to stop me from studying. So they got me the audition, and 
I, once I went to the shooting galleries in New York, and once I went to the drug house, and once I started doing the research, I said, I have bitten off way more than I can chew. <laughs> no wonder everyone failed. Yeah. You just, you got to be, you have a discipline. And so they believed in me, and, and they flew me out, and I went, I cleared my room at the Wyndham Hotel of all the furniture, ate a cherry pie, and got a sugar, diabetes, dark, you know, is <laughs> crazy. And I, I, I learned the whole, all the scenes, put them together like a monologue, and um, cut a dress up, red garter belt stockings, some Hello Salo pumps, and, and uh, a blonde, platinum blonde wig, wild makeup and eyelashes. And I stood in the mirror and went, oh my God, I'm scaring myself to death. <laughs> but I didn't stutter. Yay. Because I was prepared, deeply prepared. And so uh, I walked to the, the manager knew what he was doing, lovely man. And I said, okay, now you know I'm here for this audition now. I'm gonna come out the elevator. Please don't have me arrested, okay? <laughs> and so he says, I can't wait to see what you're gonna do. And I know I love you. <laughs> so I come down the elevator and it stops open on, on a, a lower floor and in walks Carol Burnett. <laughs> and she walks in and she turns around, she goes, <gasps> You know, and she has that, and I said, please, please breathe, please breathe, please breathe. I, I'm an actor, I'm auditioning for Paul Newman, please don't, I'm not going to hurt you. <laughs> she was like, okay, you're going to get it, you think, good luck. <laughs> and I admired her so much, and all I wanted to do was come out of character to worship her. You don't know I want to be a comedian, I love you. And so we go down, and I come out the, the, the hotel, I start walking down Avenue Americas towards the, the theater, and people are like, it's working. Yeah. And then the police <laughs> drive up and stop. I'm going to jail. Yeah. <laughs> a blue and white, hey, mommy, what you doing? You know, I said, well, I'm going to an audition. I'm looking like a drugged out hooker, so please don't arrest me. I have the letter in my pocket. You know, I'm trying to, you know, keep the main, it's my preparation. Right, stay in character. Walking up to the theater, and he says, okay, we thought you were for real. We were going to pick you up a little later. And we're like, no, I'm going to tell <laughs> on you. I'm going to tell your wife. I had to be so profane, so repugnant, so horrible to be this character when I walked in and I sat down, I said, just read, just start to sing. Just not, you know, you're taking up my time. I gotta go make some tricks, you know, shoot up by nine, you know, so come on. <laughs> and they were like, you know, wow, okay, okay, Paul Newman. And I was like, it's Paul Newman, I cannot stutter in front of him. I cannot fail in front of him. I have to do this. I know I can do this. And so I had been doing it. The minute I walked in, thank you, Stanislavski. Yeah. I had turned a role no one thought took seriously and all my past work it was right there yeah. and I said this is what I have to give this is what where I came from where I am now and um, they started applauding and I opened my eye from my drug induced like and they said, oh, this is wonderful. It was wonderful, Paul Newman said. He says, wonderful, David, they said, you got the job. And I went, oh no, I'm really gonna stutter now. <laughs> I don't know if I, I just wanted to do the audition and go home. I didn't yeah. think I'd get it. And next you know, I'm on a 10 month shoot with Paul Newman, doing extraordinary work with him and everyone, the cast members. And I took four years off after Fort Apache, the Bronx, to do nothing but theater. I did um, Fool for Love, mm -hmm. the Sam Shepard play, 90 Minutes of No Intermission, uh, won awards for it. Everyone came and said Eddie Murphy would bring three people, the mayor would bring it. was stacked, and uh, directors would come and watch us, like Bruce Beresford and all the hot directors would come and see our work. And um, uh, Then I did uh, Frank and Johnny the Claire de Lune. I'm going to stutter because you got to be <laughs> naked on stage. Oh my God, I thought I was a naked nude suit. Can I be naked? Okay, this is the test. And I did it. Yeah. I thought very well. I was <laughs> pleased. Yeah. I was the actor. Um, then I did August Wilson cast all his, his people. And in honor of being cast by him for the piano lesson, being a pianist, I played a gospel song. 
for him. I, I created a composed one for him and sing it. So when the audience came in, they came in to me playing, not a soundtrack, but to me really playing and just to honor him. Oh. And uh, so that's the other side of me. And um, now I've been to the mountaintop with Quentin Tarantino writing for me. Mm -hmm. And if I hadn't have done the theater, I, I could have been fired. I may not have done, done been able to do his level of, of work. And he is demanding. Not everyone can work with him. Not everyone can. And you have to rehearse. And he doesn't choose everyone. There's certain people who don't. He's not into to celerity and stardom. And he's in, into the, the acting. just came over here to talk to you. To talk? The way I see it, you and me got one thing to talk about. One thing. And that's what you are willing to do for me. I can get your lawyer. Oh, no, L let's be realistic. Now, sooner or later, they're going to get around to offering me a plea deal. And you know that. That's why you came here to kill me. <laughs> I ain't come over here oh, to no, kill you. Okay. It's okay. Now, I forgive you. Now, let's say, if I tell on you, I walk. If I don't, I'll go to jail. Uh -huh. I want $100,000 in an escrow account in my name if I'm convicted up to a year or put on probation. Now, if I have to do more than a year, you pay another $100,000. What it does in my life and challenges and meeting and falling and stumbling and surviving cancer and everything, it gives you that character to say, I can bring something to the role. I can bring that intimacy to the role. I can bring the strength or the silent strength to the role. And I met Paul Ver Verhoeven. I had met, and he wanted me in his movie Predator. He called me, hey, I want you to come do my movie. Paul, I'm sorry, I just had surgery for cancer. And not just do you have cancer, you're given how long to live? 18 months to 18 live? 18 months. It's, it's going to be done. You're it's, stage five. It, I'm four going into five and didn't know it, had no symptoms. I was running six miles a day. You know, the, the most, the, the fittest I'd ever been, 117, too skinny for my height and, and uh, uh, I guess, body mass, and no smoking mm -hmm. ever, no cigarettes, uh, pipes, cigars, no drinking, heavy drinking. I, I had a little Jack Daniels when it came to studying for my <laughs> finals now. Made me a genius. Yeah. And uh, you know how you relax and everything yeah. is okay. And um, I was really sick and I didn't know it. And Peter Douglas, who is a producer of Something Wicked This Way Comes, Kirk Douglas' son, his parents have donated and built a wing at Cedars. So that's how he found out that I was there, and uh, he was just a producer, and we were we were colleagues, but not friends. Didn't know him, and and he comes in, and I can hardly move. It's my third surgery. Gregory Hines had called, sent flowers over, and the door opens, and here's he says, "Hi, it was your boss on something wicked." Oh, oh, <laughs> he was comforting. Yeah. He said, we will provide for you the best care. Ray Bradbury wanted you to do our movie. He selected you. And we told the company that you were Egyptian because they were opposed to you being African American. So, And I was like, all exotic and doing all the dances that I learned. You know, I was going to be a ballerina. So anyway, um, he was very supportive. And the, a friend of mine who is the president of the Writers Guild, Carl Gottlieb, who was my mentor at Women in Film, and, uh, and Tammy Hoffs, who s supported me and signed me in, uh, was my, my mentor for Women in Film as well, because I want to be a writer-director. And, you know, everyone doesn't know this, so they don't right. want to know. And um, they came, these special people, every day, and uplifted me. And it, it, it so affected me. Because the friends that I thought, who were my friends and I had, and the boyfriend of three years who, I ha who I'd helped and was, I thought would be there, they weren't there. And these special people were there at my bedside, didn't care how I looked or smelled, and just watched me, oh, i got to take my dimmer all right now, 
And um, they watch me in pain. They watch me eat soup, and people come in and seeing me when you're at your, you know, most human. Right. And no judgment, and they just uplifted me every day. And I, I got better because I said I wanna, I wanna come back and thank them. Is the Pam Greer today, after that scare, after all of that, different than the woman before? Did it change you somehow? It added. Yeah. It didn't change because I was growing into that. I, it, it, we used to save uh, blue chip stamps. I don't know. You're yeah. probably oh, too yeah. young for that. And SFW we'll stamps <laughs> um, for my car coat. Mm -hmm. And because everyone was saving for our tuition. So. Things like that, it was stamps and coupons and bottle, whatever. I babysat, I cut lawns. For, so I got my car coat and I was at school. It was cold and one of my playmates, she didn't have a coat. And I said, where's your coat? She was cold and she was crying. And I said, well, okay, you can have mine. And I gave her my coat to keep her warm. I said, you know, my metabolism, I'm a all over the place child and um, it kept her warm and she stopped crying and when I got home everyone went berserk I mean you gave away <laughs> your coat you it was 25 stamp books yeah. to get your favorite coat now but they won't have it you have long arms you won't you know and I, and I said why Pammy because she was crying she was cold and I didn't want her to be cold I was okay I was okay and I since then I have an empathy a profound empathy that extends past my work. I turned down work because it's not the right money. Throw it at me. Let's see if we can pull her in with all this money. No, thank you. I passed graciously. What? You passed on us and all this money? Yeah, it's, I, sometimes I do things for glory. Yeah. You know, I do things because all those things taught me how to say no at the right time and yes at the right time and if I survived that cancer and all that I had to go through with which is another night with you it and the people that I saw around me who died younger than I was more affluent successful education names on buildings and streets and I'm surviving and I've got more puncture wounds in skin or no hair no eyebrows just people don't recognize me mm -hmm. I'm invisible but it made me stronger I said I'm okay I got to do something really really nice and make real I got to meet Paul Newman <laughs> and I got to make decisions I got I was given choices and I got to I had the opportunity to take advantage of those choices and I think I made some really good ones because of how I survived, how I saw people, how I saw other people suffer, and how I didn't want them to suffer, and how I could help. And I thought if I, if I, if I, and they say, yes, you beat cancer, but I don't know that because I've lost parts of me that are vulnerable, and I c it can return at any time. I can come out of remission. So. I, I live as, as strongly as I can. Um, for Thanksgiving, I had a neon green smoothie. <laughs> I didn't tell, and everyone was enticing me, no, I'm having this celery, apple juice, mint smoothie with protein, raw protein. They went, ew, what are you, crazy? You're really old, aren't you? Uh, and <laughs> just discipline for me. And uh, I, I was uh, by myself preparing to come here. Uh, the speech, I had a, a lot of work and I turned down some projects and series. And uh, I'm not being arrogant to say like, oh, I could turn things down. Not, no, not at all. It just didn't fit. Right. It wasn't right. Someone else will do it exceptionally well, better than I could. And um, I like being in that place. And thanks to Roger Corman and Stanislavski and Quentin Tarantino and being uh, a, a, a absolute fan of Meryl Streep. Sophie's Choice is my favorite, Raging Bull. Um, Wes Anderson, you know Grand Budapest Hotel and the 
the life of, uh, of, of Steve Zazu and uh, I, I mean I have my quirkiness and my reality of, of you know of uh, between Malcolm X and Selma and the Last Mohicans and Miami Vice and Crime Story and the L Word <laughs> and a wide spectrum of of work. And when I did the L Word, there were people that thought I would turn into a lesbian because I was around so many of them. And I was going, okay, miles before we sleep, there's a lot of work to be done here. But I was a beacon. I provided a comfort zone for people who didn't know or understand the LGBT world. Thank you for all the work, for all the choices you've made, for the projects you've brought us, for the joy, and also for all the work that you do with people outside of just what they see on, on the screen, and your care for animals, your care for children, and your care for people who are having a hard time in life and the good you've done to help them. Well, we're, we're a better actor when we observe humanity. Yeah. Well, a pleasure. Pam Greer. Like to learn more about our guests or watch other episodes of interviews, visit our website at houstonpublicmedia.org/interviews.